So um, this is what we're planning to cover tonight. Um, so we're going to go through what this, a bit more about the scheme, who can apply, um, go through some kind of frequently asked questions and myths that might arise um, surround the screen. We'll go through the host organisations. Like I said, you'll get an opportunity to meet the clinical fellows. Um, and there's an opportunity to ask questions at the end during the talk if you have got questions. If you type them into the chat rather than unmuting and then we can um, answer them as we're going through. Um, that'd be great. And just a bit of housekeeping again, if everyone keeps, make sure they're muted throughout just so there's no interruptions. Um, right, so the scheme's now been running for 12 years. It's taken through um, 250 other um, fellows throughout that time. And it offers a really unique opportunity that you're probably not going to get throughout other areas of your training. Um, it's been described as life-changing by previous fellows. Um, so you'll get 12 months in a national healthcare affiliated organisation um, such as NHS England, um, GMC, and we'll go through the other organisations. It's outside of clinical practice and it gives you the opportunity to develop your skills in leadership and management in a way that you wouldn't get in your normal clinical role, um, however, kind of wherever you are within that. It's not a shadowing scheme. So in that sense, it's very unique in that you're actually gonna be a clinical lead in a project and have the opportunity to get a very hands-on experience. Um, so that's quite good. Um, and it's not falling within a speciality scheme. Um, the posts commence um, in September 2020 and run for 12 months. Um, so who can apply? Um, you need to be fully GMC registered. You need to have completed um, your FY2. Um, you can be in any speciality, um, as long as you're not going to gain CCT by the 1st of September 2022, um, you're eligible to apply. The Generally, it's about 292 candidates who apply, um, and there's been a 20% increase, um, there's a 20% increase in the number of applications last year. The ratio um, for each post is nine to one. So it's a pretty, it's a very competitive scheme. It's highly competitive. Um, 62 candidates were shortlisted last year. Um, and out of those 32 candidates were appointed. Are you doing? Are you climbing? Yeah. Um, if I could just remind everyone to mute. Um, so the other person who's presenting with me tonight, who I should have started, who I should have introduced at the beginning is Raul, who's another uh, fellow. So I'll um, let him present this slide. Sure, thanks, Sonny. That's all right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our evening seminar. So just to tell you a bit more about the scheme in particular. So, um, well, the first question many people often have is if, you're, if you want to do the scheme less than full time. And there is some flexibility, and that really does depend on each host organization because they give an allotted number of slots to FMLM who then advertise and recruit for them. And... Um, some slots are designed for less than full-time trainees, whilst others can be negotiated if possible. Now, um, the clinical fellows are based in various different locations. A lot of the posts are around the London area. However, that's what well, for this year has mattered a bit less because of um, the focus on working from home. And we're only just returning to our workplaces now. Um, but there are like specific posts based in Leeds, for example, some with NHS Digital and in the Midlands with um, NHS England as well. Um, so another key question is uh, about pay often. And um, this is really to uh, reassure everyone that just because we come off our on-call rotors, uh, we don't necessarily take a, a massive pay cut. So the way the scheme works is you're often, you're paid at the next training grade you would have ascended to had you not taken a year out of your training. And um, you're given a 20% uplift on that base salary. So excluding any on-calls, on-call allowances you may have. So your base salary at the next grade plus a 20% uplift plus a London waiting if applicable. Um, as I said, this year and uh, for the majority of last year, there's been a big focus on working from home. 
Um, but again, this depends on each host. Like I know a lot of our clin current clinical fellows are working from home with a couple of days in the office here and there, whilst um, one or two people have returned to like office working for most of their time period. Um, if we have a look at the next slide, Sunny. Um, and these are all of the host organizations that we've got participating in the uh, National Medical Directors Clinical Fellow Scheme. And as you can see, most of the um, organizations aren't specialty specific. So really this experience is about providing anyone, any doctor in training who um, wants to build on their leadership and management skills, wants to learn how the other world within the NHS works um, and the non-clinical side of it. And there's a whole host of organizations who are very keen actually to take fellows because they all feed back and say that they benefit greatly from the work that the fellows do. And um, there's one that's specialty specific, which is the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. And you'll hear more from um, the fellow who's working within that organization later on today. But all of the others are very um, a general clinical fellow posts that will enable you to develop a very unique skill set that otherwise you, we, none of us would normally have the experience of developing within our normal clinical working lives. Um, shall we move on? Yep. My screen's frozen. Right, there we go. Um, so this is a little bit about what um, you get specifically um, from FMLM. So you get this fantastic opportunity, like we've just talked about, to be part of another organisation and get that experience, that hands-on experience. But you also need a robust sort of education programme and a support framework to, so that you know you can learn the key skills of leadership. Um, and that's what FMLM provides. Um, so they provide a sort of training program with modules throughout the year. Um, there's lots of resources on their website that they give um, and there's presentations with the previous um, alumni to see how they've progressed and how they've used this year um, quite often to progress to other um, things and how they've kind of used it as a springboard. You'll get different learning sets and lots of other things. So as in the beyond, so there's host insight days where you can learn about other hosts and other organizations. Um, there's speaker events and dinners as well. Um, there's a leaders in healthcare conference that we're all looking forward to and going to next week. Um, there's a leadership passport, which is um, an opportunity for you to sort of again just record and build on your experience you can take part in the bmj leader and there's an opportunity to get mentoring from not just within your own host organization but from other host organizations who are participating in the scheme so there's generally a lot to do and you can also obviously network with all the other fellows that's an invaluable resource as well um so now you can we can introduce you to some of our fellows. Um, so this is who you'll be hearing from today. So we'll start with Annika. Thanks so much, Sunny and Rahul. Um, hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here and to be able to um, speak to you this evening. It feels like yesterday that I was attending the webinar last year when I was considering um, applying for the fellow scheme. So huge congratulations on taking the first step and spending an hour with us this evening. Um, so I am the uh, clinical fellow working at the General Medical Council. I wasn't in a training program when I applied, so I've completed my core medical training, but I haven't yet applied for specialty training. I know it looks like a bizarre selection of images on this slide, but I'm going to try and talk around them and hopefully it will sort of beautifully come back full circle, but forgive me if I go off a little bit. So as I mentioned, I work at the uh, General Medical Council and the image you can see at the top of the slide is where um, the institution was established primarily as a regulatory body um, in the last century now, at the beginning of the last century. I think as doctors, we're all really familiar with the kind of regulatory function of the organisation. But one of the things I've learned from working there is just how broad um, the functions really are. So they get involved with so much, uh, specifically looking at um, ethics and providing guidance for doctors. There's obviously the fitness to practice arm. There's also education and standards, uh, colleges, um, curricula. 
and education um, is up to the standards set by the GMC and they have massive levers to pull in this arena, which means the work they do is really broad. I've got a picture of the United Kingdom there just because one of the unique things about the GMC is that you do work across all four nations. So um, whereas some organisations are very limited to England, actually you do end up spending a lot of time um, collaborating with the devolved nations and that's really exciting to know that the work that you're doing really does spread across the UK. But you can see the image below then is obviously that collaborative process. Um, I'm working specifically in education policy which requires so much kind of teamwork and followership much like as you can imagine hospital medicine is like um, and I think that's something I've really enjoyed about the role so far. The slightly odd icon, um, it almost looks like a lavatory icon, doesn't it, with a microphone, really was to, to kind of explain what I'm doing in this role. So uh, everyone says, you know, as a clinical fellow, it's really important that you use your clinical voice to shape everything you do. And that's sometimes kind of easier said than done, but I've always got at the back of my mind, actually, how does what we do make a difference to clinicians on the ground? And I think that's a really important part of this role is, kind of ensuring that the work that you're doing is going to make a difference on the ground. Um, and I think it's really important to be mindful of that. And that's certainly what I'm mindful of in my kind of education policy role. So starting to come back full circle, what am I gonna do with this role afterwards? What am I gonna do with all the skills that I've learned? Well, hopefully I'm gonna apply for um, geriatrics as my specialty of choice. I think it links really well to a lot of the work that I'm doing at the GMC. It, is um, well, it relies heavily on the kind of multidisciplinary team and multi professional working. It involves an awful lot of collaboration, um, teamwork, followership, as well as some really strong leadership, especially as we know that um, the kind of demographic demands require that. And so I think a lot of the skills that I learned this year are going to be really transferable when I go back. I've then got these two images of some ladies that I look up to, but I also think are really important when I consider my career going forward. So um, the lady on the left is um, Professor Deborah Bowman. She is Deputy Principal at the medical school I trained at, which is St George's. She is a Professor of um, Medical Law and Ethics. She's incredibly eloquent. Um, she is a brilliant leader and is always someone I've really, really admired. Oh, and yeah. to see her as deputy principal, um, I think is, is really exciting and does show that just how much things have changed. And then on the right is, of course, um, Professor Dame Claire Marks, who has only recently stepped down as chair of the GMC. She is the first uh, female chair in the history of the organisation. So I think to see two females in such powerful leadership roles, and even on the same slide, I know I've made the slide, but even on the same slide as me, I think is really exciting. And um, I think really shows that, you know, that things are moving and this is a real opportunity for us to make a difference in this space. Thanks. Cool. Thanks a lot, Sonny. Um, we'll now hear from our next fellow. So. Um, Rob? Brilliant, thanks Rahul. Um, so my slide is a little bit different and and that's largely because what I really wanted to highlight is that um, I am based specifically in the Midlands so I am currently working for NHS England and NHS Improvements in the Midlands team. Um, I am a GP trainee by background um, in Lincolnshire uh, so that you can see a little uh, arrow that points uh, to where my training practice is and you can see the front door on the right. Um, but at my office base at um, NHS England is in Derby. Um, I've been a trainee in the Midlands um, since I went to medical school. So I've, I've been in the Midlands for quite a long time now. Um, and it, for me, it's been a really great experience to be working in an organisation where the changes I make involve working with organisations where I've worked um clinically and also in an area that I know relatively well geographically now and that's been something I've really really enjoyed so far in the fellowship um when I say that my office base is Derby um I've yet to actually go into the office so as we've sort of already alluded to a little bit this evening a lot of us have um had an experience of spending lots of time um working from home and certainly for me 
my entire work so far has been working from home and that's where the sort of pitch in the top left comes in because I am often distracted by my dog um, who likes to climb on top of me or anyone for that matter. Um, but certainly that's been one of the things that I find quite challenging so far about about the scheme and it's something it's really had to teach me to look at at working in new ways and managing work-life balance in new ways compared to working clinically um, and a lot of us talk a lot about having emails on our phone and and often having that kind of demand of we could work a lot a lot longer than we should be working and so that's one of the challenges that I think really um is worth thinking about in the fellowship and, and thinking about what that might mean for you in work. But at the same time, it's something I've learned some really important skills and I know that those skills will be really important for me when I go back and, and qualify as a GP and then working clinically where, where increasingly workload in primary care um, can partly be done from home and there would be the potential to, to need to think about that. In terms of the work I'm doing, I, I do quite a lot of different areas of work um, in, in the Midlands. So about 50% of my time is working with the medical workforce team um, on a variety of projects um, around both staffing and looking after uh, trainee doctors as well in the East Midlands. And um, one of the projects that I've been really lucky to, to be involved in and take over leading on is something called the Midlands Charter, which um, won the BMJ award for workforce and wellbeing uh, this year and it's been really exciting to to get to work on that really on something that affects trainees across the area and, and making sure that that trainee voice remains really loud um, when we're when we're talking about things that impact trainees so that's been a fantastic piece of work that I've been involved in um, I'm doing things that are completely out of my comfort zone as well so I'm the clinical lead for a project um, looking at telemedicine in critical care in Worcester, um, for example. So, and that's very much out of my comfort zone as a GP. So I think what's what's fantastic about the scheme is is my, the opportunity that I've had already to be involved in things that are making a real difference to people and that that's being recognised at a high level, to do things that are massively outside of my comfort zone, perhaps um, with things like the critical care um, and to work with colleagues from very different backgrounds and bring that cl clinical perspective and one of the things again to sort of reiterate one of the things that Annika mentioned is that actually that clinical voice is really valued in the organisations and um, lots of these projects don't have the opportunity to work so closely with such a clinical voice um, embedded within them always and so to have the opportunity to provide that is a real privilege um, and I think that's probably all of the main things that I wanted to say. So I'll uh, hand over to who's next. Um, so next we're hearing from Vish, who's at the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. Hi, hi, Sunny. Can we get someone called Oliver A to mute their microphone, please? Um, Oliver Hay, could you please mute your microphone? Thank you. Oh. Hello, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, okay, great. So um, I'm gonna take you through the who, the what, and the why of uh, being the fellow at the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. Really, you don't need much of the why because obviously you will all want to be hosted at the Royal College of Ophthalmology. So next slide, please. Oh. So yeah, starting with the WHO, so I am a South London-based uh, ophthalmology trainee. I was an ST4 when I applied, and that was actually the year that I was um, sending my exit exams. So I was bang in the middle of having just sat the uh, written, and I was preparing for the oral component. So that's just to give you an idea of where I was at in my training. Next slide, please. In terms of the interest in this kind of slightly different area of, of medicine, it was actually stemmed back from when I was at university. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to attend something called the Management in Medicine seminar series. And essentially we had access to lectures and a shadowing scheme that kind of puts you in contact with leaders uh, within the healthcare industry. This led on to me setting up a special studies module, which I then um, did a project as part of, and, and that was actually presented at one of the first ever FMLM conferences. 
um, I've carried this interest on within training. So I've been kind of doing projects uh, along the way. And the reason for mentioning this is you'll all be on different sort of leadership journeys. And don't worry if this is, you know, your first step into it. But it's just to say it is something that, you, you know, it may well be an interest that that will have been incepted from, from even before taking part in the scheme. Uh, I've put two links there. One is a link to all of our kind of mini profiles that you can follow on the FMLM website if you want to have a bit more of an idea of how we came to, to do this. And the one just underneath uh, is specifically my, my journey. Next slide, please. And yeah, that's just a little screen grab of what it looks like. So yeah, next slide. So the college actually only hosts one fellow, and this is the second year that they've taken part. Uh, and if we go into the next slide, on the Royal College of Ophthalmology website, you'll be able to find a bit more about what it is that I'm doing this year. Next slide, please. So why do it? So I've copied and pasted there the tagline from, uh, I think, the, the marketing material. Um, and essentially, it is obviously all those things. But for me personally, I've always believed that clinicians are best placed to serve as leaders in healthcare. And I think for all of you, it'd be really good to, to understand why exactly it is you're drawn to this. There will be something that has meant that you, you know, decided to take the first step and log in today. And it's a very brave thing to do because for a lot of us, it's, it's not really in our comfort zone. Um, however, it is an incredibly important aspect of healthcare. Um, for me, I had a, a fairly recent example of a consultant who had taken this path. So when I was an ST1 in my induction week in London, one of the talks I was given by was by an uh, ophthalmology consultant called Ian Rodriguez. And he had actually taken part in the scheme many years before. And an interesting that, thing that he mentioned was that it ended up being a real key discriminator at his consultant interview. Uh, and he is now a consultant based at a teaching hostel uh, in London. And building on that, so I think the leadership option does provide an alternative route to the traditional research or teaching route that can still give you a portfolio career. And then the last thing to mention this year, uh, you know, there's memes about what feels illegal but isn't. The fact that I've been given my evenings and weekends back that I can take annual leave when I want it has fallen in really well with my life plans. I plan to get married this year. And it's a great opportunity to just step off the, the kind of rat race of, of, of training and, and actually develop different skills. Next slide, please. So what is it that I actually do? I think this slide really nicely encapsulates uh, what I spend most of my time doing. So I'm either between Zoom or Teams or I'm making or drinking a coffee. Um, but yeah, if we go into the next slide, I'll tell you a bit, bit more about what I'm doing. So I've just outlined here a few of the work streams that I'm involved on. The last count, I think there were about nine. Um, but here is just a bit of an overview. So one of the big things that takes up my time is working with the National Eye Care Recovery and Transformation Program. And I actually work with colleagues at NHS e &I on that, looking at essentially innovative, innovative ways that um, providers are delivering healthcare across the country, uh, and then also a series of other more specific projects. Then I'm also involved in policy work. So I'm part of several working groups at the Royal College of Ophthalmology, and I've listed some of those there. Uh, and then also there's been the opportunity to get involved in things that I probably would have got involved in as a trainee, but I have time and capacity to do it uh, and give kind of more time towards it. So education and training, as well as being a principal co-investigator on the National Ophthalmology Database for a project that we've got planned later this year. Next slide, please. So now I will just do a bit of reflection on the year so far. Next slide, please. So the pros are that you get dedicated time to develop new skills and time to spend on projects that you may have otherwise done, but you don't then have the competing pressures of on calls and clinics. And you get to meet and hear from some really extraordinary people. Uh, and then there's autonomy, you know, you're your own boss. And for me, working from home has been a very positive change because I was doing about 100 miles a day last year with cross-site working and, and it's a real, nice change to not have to do that. Next slide, please. Oops, oops. Here's a, an example of the kind of extraordinary people that you get to meet. So I was privileged enough to be invited to the college council dinner, which happens once a year. And our keynote speaker was Professor Chris Whitty, uh, and in which he contemplated a vitrectomy, which some of you in the ophthalmology world will know is referred to as a witty. So I came up 
a vitty. So I came up with a tagline, Prof Witty contemplates vitty. So there you go. Next slide, please. So what are the cons? The cons for someone in a surgical specialty in particular, you are extending your training time by a year and there, there aren't really opportunities to, to operate. And actually, I know I mentioned working from home as a, as a positive, but it is also negative in the sense that you have to get used to kind of working uh, with, with no real company and, um, you know, being in, in an office space or in your home for, for kind of lots, many hours in a day and, and, and basically most of the days of the week. However, there are ways to mitigate against those things. Next slide, please. And the way I've done that is I am able to go back to the college to use the simulator about once a month. Uh, and I've negotiated being able to attend uh, regional study days and I've been given a, a study budget to attend conferences. And that's just a really nice way to, to keep in touch with trainees, you know, that you would normally be seeing in your day-to-day -day work and also keep on top of your kind of academic side of things. So next slide, please. So in summary, I do think it is a great opportunity to do something different. You'll be able to learn new skills and develop a niche. Uh, last thing to say would be thank you for your attention and good luck. And if you do have any questions that come to mind afterwards, please do feel free to email me. Um, thanks, Vish. So we've um, now got Rada, who's a HGE. Hi, everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, so I'm Rada. I'm one of the fellows at Health Education England this year. Um, it's great to be here this evening and talk to you all. As Annika said, I can't believe it's been a year already. Time has flown. It feels like we applied about five minutes ago. Um, my background is I'm a urology registrar. I'm an ST5 and I'm based in North London. Um, I firstly just wanted to touch on why I applied. So um, throughout training, I dabbled in some small scale leadership experiences, but I realised I knew very little about the wider NHS landscape and how the whole ecosystem actually works. Having gone straight through training all the way from medical school to SD5, I felt like I wanted to step out of clinical practice and broaden my horizons and just gain a wider perspective on things. The scheme was offering me a completely unique experience where I could do all of these things as well as develop my own leadership skills and learn from senior leaders. Some of the hesitations I had, which I think is important to talk about, so similar to what Vish was saying, um, the fact that I was a, a surgical trainee, um, it wasn't very well known amongst my cohorts uh, or my consultants versus, say, taking time out to do something like a PhD. Um, and then there's, there was also the fear that I would go away for a year and come back completely losing all my technical skills. Um, however, I would say I was very lucky in that my TPD was extremely supportive and understood the value that leadership development can bring. Um, so she supported me the whole way through this application process. Um, and in terms of kind of clinical or operating skills, I do have the ability to do operating lists or locums if I want to. Um, and lots of colleagues have taken out a similar amount of time for things like maternity leave, and, and I'm told it all comes back to you, so I'm hopeful. Um, as the others have said, I also have some reservations with it being possibly a virtual experience. Um, I've been quite lucky in that for me, it's been a hybrid experience. So I've had the chance to meet people face to face and go into the office as well as work from home. Um, there are advantages of virtual working. Um, so obviously the benefits of working from home in general, which a lot of us didn't experience throughout the pandemic. Um, but it is actually also much easier to, to join meetings with seniors and have some autonomy about what you get involved with, which might be harder if, if things are face to face. A bit more about HE specifically. Um, so many of you will have heard of HE already. So it's an arm's length organisation and its role is to provide national leadership and coordination for education and training within the health workforce. Um, as a fellow, um, you work within the Directorate of Education and Quality, which is a large team that's responsible for areas like medical and dental education reform, undergraduate education, primary care and workforce alignment. Um, some specific, specific projects that I've worked on or I'm working on at the moment are um, enhancing junior doctor working lives, co-chairing a national training engagement forum, junior doctor well-being, COVID recovery, um, and, and there are a few more as well. Um, so people often ask me what I actually do day to day. Um, I would say it's a lot of meetings, as has already been said. 
Um, some of these are project related meetings, but also meetings that I want to attend for my own development. So senior management or policy meetings. Um, there's also a lot of meeting individuals and networking with people. And this can be whoever you like, really. So um, I've honestly found that being a fellow that everybody is happy to talk to you and you can get in whoever's diary you want, um, which has been a great advantage. Um, then there's some project specific work, which would vary depending on the specific project you were doing or the organisation you were in. So, for example, one of my projects involves me writing a report, whereas there's other projects that involve me arranging national webinars. So it, it's quite varied. Um, AT was actually my first choice when applying. And the reason was uh, firstly because I have a genuine interest in training and education, but it was also recommended to me by previous fellows who had had an amazing experience throughout their fellowship and rightly advised me that HE are really supportive and give you a lot of autonomy in whatever projects you want to get involved in, depending on your interests. Um, so what do I want to do next? I think given that I only have three years left, I will definitely finish my training. Um, and it's early days, but I'm definitely keeping an open mind as to where this will take me in the future uh, in terms of clin what clinical practice will look like for me. Um, so please feel free to ask me any questions in the chat. What I would say, just to uh, end this, is I had massive imposter syndrome when applying. So I felt I didn't have any impressive experience. But please don't let this put you off, as it's all about what you feel, you feel like you're going to get out of the scheme. Um, so good luck to all of you applying. Thanks a lot, Rather. Um, I'm going to hand over to our last fellow for um, from the current cohort, and that's uh, Paradwa Chadha, who's with me at NHS Tax. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Baradwaj or Baz. I'm also one of the clinical fellows at NHSX. Um, so what I thought I'd do that might be quite useful is just to tell you a little bit about my journey to date. Uh, I've come into the scheme as a post F2, so doing this kind of as an F3. Uh, so I thought it might be useful for some of you who are kind of earlier on in your career journeys and sort of how you might think about approaching the application process. Tell you a little bit about my thought process when I was applying for it what life is currently like at NHSX and some of the projects that I'm working on. Um, what next, which is a bit misleading given that we're only two months in, um, but I think already you can start to get a bit of an idea as to um, likely next steps or the kind of trajectory you might want your career to take. And I thought I'd just finish with some tips that I think you guys might find helpful when it comes to just refining your applications as you look to submit the, um, the white space questions. That's just a um, my email there and also a QR code to my LinkedIn. So I'm more than happy for you guys to, to reach out if you need any help with, with application after this. So in terms of my journey today, as I said, I graduated from what many consider to be the finest medical school in all the land. I went to King's. I graduated in 2019 and previously did a BSc in healthcare management whilst I was there as well. And that is really what I would say sparked my interest in kind of policy, strategy, management within healthcare, um, and so after that, I did the Academic Foundation Program in Leadership and Management in the East Midlands. And so, yeah, that was kind of my route or what I had done prior to this. As part of the AFP, I did an internship at NICE, working as an analyst within the Interventional Procedures uh, Program, sitting on the uh, Interventional Procedures Advisory Committee, um, which was a good opportunity just to look at the process by which kind of new interventional techniques are, are brought into NICE guidelines and things like that. So for me, as I said, I've been interested in the kind of bigger picture of healthcare management strategy and policy within healthcare and also in technology and data driven approaches to healthcare since I was an undergrad. So NHSX for me kind of represented a, nat a natural place where the two converge um, and to, uh, to learn a bit more about technology in healthcare at a more kind of national strategic level. I, I actually knew a friend of a friend who'd done the AFP before me, who'd done the fellowship at the BMJ. Um, and that was how I came to be aware of the scheme. And really for me, after F2, I was keen to kind of understand in a more systematic and more methodical way um, what goes into, into policy making and into strategy um, at the very highest levels of, of decision making and, and of government. Um, so now within NHSX, so I'm currently involved in a few different projects, notably with, with the digital clinical safety team, the AI strategy, so the national AI strategy for health and care team. So we're due to be publishing our national strategy in spring of next year, which is currently being drafted and out for consultation. And recently also the elective recovery team as well. So within that, I'm kind of working, looking at digital personalized patient improved follow up, patient initiated follow ups or PIFUs um, and how we can use that to, to redress the backlog of elective services. 
Um, just echoing some of um, some of the you know the, the points the previous fellows had made, I think it's been you know it's been a really it's been a great opportunity, and also it's been quite a nice change of pace from clinical medicine as well. It's been nice to have your weekends and your evenings and your nights to yourself, um, and working from home as well. I think it's made things a little bit difficult in as much as getting to know your team members um, and kind of your, your colleagues is concerned, but also it's nice to, to have that, that freedom and the flexibility to be able to work from, from the comfort of your own house. Um, typically working at NHSX, they're quite hot on agile methodologies and working in quite an agile way. So that'll be kind of, we'll be working in short sprints where we'll have like a sprint planning session and then daily stand-ups throughout the sprint and then a sprint retrospective at the end. So. Generally, we kind of, whatever project we're working on, we'll break it down into smaller components just to make it a bit more manageable and easier to, to stay on top of what you're doing. As I said, in terms of, in terms of what I'm doing next or what I'd like to do next, um, I would obviously like to enter a training program. I'm, I'd be interested in, in being a GP. Um, but one option to consider, and both of the outgoing fellows at NHSX, one of whom is an anaesthetist and the other is a pediatrician, uh, both of them are staying back as less than, as clinical advisors. So they're going back onto their training program as less than full-time trainees. Um, so that's an option to, to consider about whether you can possibly stay on as a clinical advisor. And I guess if I'm being very kind of uh, reflective, I think that although NHSX is the kind of technology branch of the NHS, it is still first and foremost a policy making unit. Um, so I still feel like I have a health tech itch that I'd like to scratch. Um, so maybe working in the private sector um, for, a, for a startup or, or something like that would probably help me to, to kind of meet that aim um, or that interest. <clears throat> in terms of um, some helpful tips that I think you guys might want, uh, you, know, might, you know, might find useful. In terms of your application itself, firstly, don't be intimidated or overwhelmed by some of the bios or profiles of the other candidates you might see, you know, looking back over the previous cohorts. Um, I suppose what the FMLM are quite hot on, you know, they look for the depth of your experience and your achievements rather than the breadth. Um, and what they, what they look for is kind of what's your enthusiasm, what's your experience, you know, commensurate or relative to where you are in your stage of training. Um, so definitely it might be something that to you, doesn't necessarily seem that prestigious or impressive on paper, but if it's something actually that you learned a lot from about the QI process, for example, or about change management or about yourself as a medical leader, then in many ways, that's more impactful and more high yield than just listing a bunch of things that you've done. Um, as far as the white space questions are concerned as well, definitely get a range of people to look over them and encourage them to be quite critical. I remember when I was applying for it, I sent it to one of my earlier drafts to a former fellow and he was absolutely brutal. He like ripped it, ripped it apart. And at first it was quite disheartening, but actually looking back, I think it was some of the best feedback I'd received in terms of really refining my application. Um, I mean, at the same time that, you know, you, you are the best judge of what goes into it um, and what you think best kind of covers um, what, what they're asking for in the question. So do take it with a pinch of salt, but definitely read the job description and the personal specification carefully. Ensure your answers match what they're looking for. Try to see whether, you know, each of the essential criteria in the job description, whether you, you kind of are ticking it in your answers at least once. And um, the last thing to say is really focus on being quite critically reflective, focus on introspection and making your application personal to what you've done. Um, because it's not the volume of your achievements, but rather what you've learned from them. Um, so yeah, definitely focus on um, on what you what you've done up to your stage of training and sort of what you've learned from those. Um, I've conscious of time, but I can I'm sort of have some other things I'd like can can kind of help you about about the shortlisting phase and a bit more about NHSX stuff. But we can kind of go into that in the Q and A section if you guys think that might be useful. But I think I'll pause there and hand back to Rahul and Sunny. That's great, thanks Baz. Um, so we will now move on to hearing from our alumni and um, previous fellows. Um, so I believe we're going to be joined by Abby. Hi Sonny, yep, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Go, should I go ahead? Yeah, sorry I don't have a slide for you. Yeah, no, no, no slides for me I think. Um, I got told about this a few hours ago. So, um, so hey, hey everyone, I'm Abby Mara. I, I did the fellowship back in 2014-15, so quite a long time ago, actually seven years ago now since I started the scheme. So I'll just spend the next five minutes um, saying, just talking a little bit about, again, why I uh, applied for the scheme and what I did and what I've done since. Um, 
so if I go back to sort of 2014 or, or even before that, um, in terms of why did I apply for the scheme, I did it post F3. So I'd done my F1 and F2 years and uh, done a further F3 year. And my reason why, similar to I think some of the other current fellows, and I also did a management degree at, at, at Imperial um, during my medical school. Uh, so I spent a year in the business school really learning about this different side of healthcare, sort of more about the management and business side of healthcare, learning about innovation, entrepreneurship and healthcare. And I found coming out of that, I was really energized and enthusiastic about that space, but didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. Um, so as a foundation doctor, I sort of started to scratch that itch, getting involved in quality improvement and was quite fortunate to get involved in um, some technology initiatives in the trust that I was working at. And again, sort of starting to build on that initial seed of interest that had been planted at the business school. And really, I came across the scheme through um, a couple of colleagues of mine from Imperial who'd done the scheme the year before I applied. Uh, they raved about how great it was. And I, I honestly, when I applied, really didn't know what to expect. But I did see it as something different. I thought it would be a year doing something very different, challenging myself in a different way. And I looked at the range of different organizations on the scheme at the time and thought there was definitely an interesting opportunity here. But if I'm brutally honest with you, I had no clue as to exactly what I'd be doing. Um, we, I didn't, don't think they had any recruitment webinars at the time. So I just thought, you know, what have I got to lose and, and threw an application in. Um, but while I was going through the process, um, one of the host organizations that caught my eye was Bupa. And that was because it was very different being a private sector organization um, and really lent itself to sort of building on those interests to learn more about the business side of healthcare, learn more about a different aspect of healthcare in terms of the private sector and how that fits into the overall landscape. So I was really fortunate enough to get onto the scheme, um, did it uh, again in 2014 um, and spent the year at Bupa and had a really fantastic year. We had an amazing cohort and I think that was one of the greatest aspects of the scheme was not just what you're doing at your, um, at your organization, but the, the team and the people you're working with. And, and, and by that, I mean, not only the, the team at Bupa, but also the fellows. And we had a phenomenal group, um, organized so many different things in terms of events, um, meetings, even managed a trip abroad to Europe and, and really, I think, got together as a unit to make the most out of that year. Now, since uh, the fellowship, I actually took a slightly different path with my career. Um, so I, at the end of the scheme, Hooper offered me a full-time position to stay on as their clinical lead for digital health, um, which I took up sort of four days a week and continued to do a bit of clinical work one day a week. And then um, a year after that, I, I got the opportunity to join IBM. Um, so um, as a lot of you know, the large technology company, they were just launching a new healthcare business unit uh, at the time and were looking for clinicians with a sort of technology and innovation background to join them. And I've really been with IBM ever since. So I've been with IBM for the last five years now, currently an associate partner in their healthcare division, um, worked across a range of different things over the last five years. Um, and I'm also outside of IBM, the co-founder of a nonprofit called Doctorpreneurs. So my career ended up taking me in a very different trajectory. So I actually ended up um, pausing my practice and I haven't practiced for the last two and a half years, um, which, you know, granted is can be quite a scary thing to do um, and led to me having to obviously develop a completely new diff and different skill set. But for me personally, it's something that I've really enjoyed. I'm happy to speak to anyone in more detail, you know, about my experience. It's, it's hard going back to my mindset in 2014, but all I can tell you about my, my approach to the application process was I didn't leave anything on the table. I really put my heart and soul into the application. Um, you have to sell yourself in terms of your achievements and don't be shy about it. And of course, if you are fortunate to be invited to interview, again, prepare really, really hard. Um, again, when you're in the interview process, you don't want to be leaving anything on the table. And, and I really came out of that interview with the biggest headache I've had in, in, in my life. And that, that was just about how much enthusiasm and energy I put into that um, interview session. And I'm glad I did because you do only get um, sometimes one opportunity at, at this type of um, scheme. And I would say, if you're going to go for it, go for it properly invest time speak to previous fellows and um and, and prepare hard and, and again happy to speak more outside of um this webinar
feel free to get in touch with me via LinkedIn, uh, connect with me and I'm happy to spend time talking through in more detail, you know, what I actually did on, on, on the scheme at Bupa and also what I've been doing in my career since at IBM in the health tech division. So again, I'll pause there. Happy to answer any questions today. And again, feel free to connect on LinkedIn as well. Again, thanks for having me this evening.